With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say great no. power. You move. Comes great response. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Welcome in, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Great to be with you. I am Caleb Colquitt. You're listening to Tactics Broadcasting Live on Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, Periscope, pretty much anywhere you can watch a video on the Internet. We are there. Annoying people. So <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. I'm, I'm in a good mood today, and I got to tell you, one of the main reasons that I'm in a good mood is because today is opening day at Riverwalk. And I was expecting a call, actually, from either Murph or one of the guys over there at the Montgomery Biscuits. But unfortunately, it looks like that is not happening. Now, it's not opening day for the season. They have already had one five-game series against the Chattanooga Lookouts, which they did very well in. And we're really looking forward to having a good season. Uh, now, granted, I don't actually know what the final tally was on that first series, but I remember that they were ahead by two games when the season started because I actually produced both of those games. So, uh, and, and I know that they actually had one game that was canceled that I was supposed to produce and wound up not being able to because they, they canceled the game because of weather conditions. So I assumed that because the best that they could have done, of course, if that was the case, was tie the series. So the biscuits, it, it, nothing else off to a good start. And today, of course, is opening day at Riverwalk. And I know that my boss, Joe, is especially excited about this. Because, of course, he hates the Biloxi Shuckers. <laughs> hates them with a passion. And I probably actually have some friends that are in the same boat as he is because the reason that Joe hates the Shuckers is because he's from Huntsville. And, of course, as you may remember, we used to play the Huntsville Stars. We don't anymore because that team moved to Biloxi. Now, Madison, Alabama is getting a brand new team, the Trash Pandas. And so we're really excited about that. That rivalry is going to be, I'm sure, a, a big win because it'll be another in-state rival for us on top of what used to be Mobile. We're actually losing one state rival and gaining another. But Madison, Alabama, a lot of my friends are excited about the Trash Pandas. They've already bought the T-shirts and everything. But right here in the city of Montgomery, there are, are some people that hate Biloxi, but the people that come from Huntsville seem to hold a grudge about it. Joe certainly does. And so... For those of you who are ready for some baseball, ready to play, I won't be there, of course, because I've got Bible study. But if you happen to be in town this week, the Biloxi Shucker series does start tonight, and it is a five-game series. So I really encourage you to go out, support our Biscuits. Great people out here. They're really involved in the community. Yes, they, they make some money here, but they're really a great draw for the city of Montgomery. Since the Biscuits have gotten here, and this would be their... I guess their 14th season, 14th or 15th season here in the city of Montgomery, the area downtown has just gotten leagues and leagues better. Yes, pun intended. I'm using the word leagues. But the since baseball has come to town, it's just gotten so much better downtown. It's been a great opportunity for downtown Montgomery and something that I thoroughly enjoy. I've been so excited to support this team as long as I have been a longtime supporter of theirs. And I encourage you to do the same. This is a great thing for our town, a great thing for our community. So I'm encouraging you right now, go out and support the Biscuits this season. Now, I know a lot of my audience is going to be at Bible study tonight. I know that I am. But especially tomorrow, they've got some great deals going on, got a lot of promotional things going on over the weekend. Please go out and support the Biscuits. That's the, the best pitch that I can give because it's just, it's so much fun. It's great for the family. It's, it's something to do here in the city. It's pretty cheap compared to a lot of things that you could do. I mean, a, a night out at the movies could be way more expensive than this if you buy concessions and everything, and the food is just phenomenal. And I do want to talk about something serious on that front. How is it that as much as mankind has advanced, that we have been able to put people on the moon 
and that we have essentially eradicated several deadly diseases. There's so many problems in this world that we have solved. How is it that it is just now we have come up with the nacho helmet? And what I'm talking about here is at Biscuit Stadium, at, at Riverwalk, now during the games, you can purchase an actual size helmet. Now, it's not a real batting helmet, obviously, because it has the, the pads in it. But this is an actual size helmet. You can put this thing on your head. It is a helmet nachos. You buy a batting helmet filled to the brim with nachos. I cannot emphasize enough how disappointed I am in mankind for just now coming up with this. I'm disappointed in myself. How did I not think of this? It's a batting helmet filled with cheesy, crunchy, salty nachos. And I, I know that's the first thing I'm doing when I get to a Biscuits game this season. You can, uh, I'm going to be at a lot of them because I have a media pass. So if you want to watch a Biscuit game, there's a good chance I'm going to be there and there's a good chance you're going to catch me out of the corner of your eye chowing down on some helmet nachos during one of their games. That's just, that blows my mind. That is, I can't wait to dig into that. And... That's not the only new food item they have. Because what's going on right now is it's the year of the bacon. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to Riverwalk Stadium. They have all kinds of bacon-themed food. They have their new Koneka sausage cart that features bacon. They have bacon-wrapped hot dogs. They have bacon on a stick. I mean, you can get just about anything with bacon. You know how, I think it's Denny's that does their their bacon fest or their bacon month or whatever it is that they do where you can get anything on the menu with bacon. I don't think it's quite going to be to that level, but that's pretty much what's going on at Riverwalk. If you want bacon on it, it's there. God bless America. <laughs> You've got uh, baseball and bacon. That's just a combination you can't beat. So really looking forward to that. And uh, hopefully they'll they'll have one of their representatives call in to give us the lowdown on what's going on this season. But until then, I did just want to bring that up. And uh, one other thing that's kind of sports related. I have a new poll out that I'm encouraging only Alabama fans to respond to this. Because the whole point of the poll is that I'm specifically wanting to gauge people that are fans of the University of Alabama. Alumni, just fans of the football team, whatever. I want to gauge them on this because it's a political question that I'm, I'm fascinated by. And that is Tommy Tuberville. Of course, you remember we talked about this on, on the show the other day. Tommy Tuberville, he is now running against other Republicans in the primary. And then if he wins, eventually Doug Jones in the Senate. So my question is, if you were an Alabama fan, do you vote for Tommy Tuberville? is the fact that he used to be the head football coach at Alabama and, by the way, went on that six-year run where he didn't lose to Alabama for six straight years. Is that something that sticks in your craw? Is that something that is a problem for you? Because some Alabama fans have said no. Thus far, at least the last time I checked the standings, the majority of Alabama fans have actually said yes. And by the way, I happen to know that there are some people that are not Alabama fans that voted. So, again... Just Alabama fans, you can check it out on my Facebook page if you happen to be Facebook friends with me. I'm, it's unscientific. I'm just curious to kind of take the temperature here and see whether or not there is a, a plurality of Alabama fans that are going to not vote for Tommy Tuberville because he's Tommy Tuberville, not because they like or dislike his policies. I'm just curious about that. And so far, what I'm seeing is most Alabama fans don't care that he was a football coach in Auburn. And I think Auburn fans would do pretty much the same thing. I think that's probably safe to say that if Nick Saban, Saban may not be a great example just because he was a Hillary supporter, so I'm guessing his policies would be kind of left, and that would be the reason a lot of Auburn fans wouldn't support him. But, but let's just say that Saban were a Republican. Let's say that he were, was, you know, 100% fiscal conservative, social conservative, somebody that aligned with the general values of the state of Alabama. If that were the case, and I thought you were the best man for the job, sure, I'd vote for him. And by the way, since we're talking about this, we should note that I'm pretty sure that Nick Saban would win any election he involved himself in. 
at this point in the state of Alabama, I think that he could run for any office and probably still win. He might have even beat Kay Ivey if he had run. I don't know. But that's just kind of where we are right now. I think that it's it's something that's kind of interesting. And I just am genuinely interested in, in seeing what Alabama fans think. Because with Tuberville, I'm just interested to see if that's going to be an anchor around his neck. Because he doesn't even need a majority of Alabama fans to vote against him because of his football record. He just needs enough of them to not consider him that would otherwise vote for him. And I'm going to tell you right now, the guy doesn't really have a platform yet. And he's completely new to the realm of politics, so that's understandable, at least for right now. But he's got a long way to go before he gets my vote on that. And so I, I'm genuinely wondering, I'm probably not going to vote for him just because there are other, in my opinion, much better, more conservative candidates. But I'm interested to see if the football factor is going to play at least enough of a role to cause him to cause the outcome of the election to change. I don't know if that's the case or not. That's a long ways off. We'll have to wait and see. But it is a fascinating, fascinating thing to study if you are a student of politics like I am. And I'm just really curious to see where it goes. So I tell you what, I know that it's early, but we're going to take a quick break here because we have a lot of show to do and we'll be back in just a moment. Abby Johnson is in the other room. Here. Our first order of business is to present Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award. Abby Johnson. There's a fire inside, you can feel this is Abby. She's our newest volunteer escort. Abby, this is Cheryl Alessandro. I'd be the youngest director in Planned Parenthood history. You'll actually be in charge of the abortions at your clinic? I have a chance to make a real difference. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, you're still going to be a baby killer. The only thing that's changed is you, Abby. Can you even hear yourself talk right now about these procedures? These are little babies. I'm not going to apologize for doing a job that helps women in crisis. There's still a part of me that isn't sure. I know. But the one thing that all experts agree on is that at this stage, the fetus can't feel anything. Sorry to bother you, but they need an extra person in the back room. Are you free? and fighting for its life. We commend the souls of these hundreds of children. And Lord, we pray to end abortion. I really appreciate what you've done for us. I'll not forget it. 22,000 abortions. How do I even comprehend that? Rough day at the office. You can say that. You're making a mess. To your dad and me, you are our baby from the moment of conception. We are paying you to be a perfect instrument of corporate policy. We are an abortion provider. I can't be part of this anymore. Everything that they told us is a lie. Don't underestimate the repercussions of this. You gotta be careful. Rhonda, please don't do this! Rhonda! Let me tell you what's gonna happen if you walk through that door. Congratulations. You make an enemy of one of the most powerful organizations on the planet. Here's the deal. There is a new corruption bill that is coming out and, and making its way through the Senate right now. And really what is, is happening here is they are gutting the former ethics laws. So to give you a little bit of context, help you understand what's going on here. Um, back in the back in the uh, 2010, when Bob Riley was the governor, when Bob Riley was the governor, they had these new ethics bills that came out because there was a long-standing history of the state of Alabama having problems with corruption. And what is going on right now is, and this is supported by a lot of senators. I wish this was just a one-off. I wish there was just one rotten senator that was dealing with this right now. But unfortunately, that is not what is going on. This is multiple senators that are supporting this. And to explain exactly the details of it, 
Essentially, it guts all of those reforms that were made back in 2010. And this is a big platform that the Republicans actually ran on. They made it central to their mission, central to their election campaigns, that what was going to happen is if you put us in power, if you give us the keys to the kingdom, if you let us run things, sweeping ethics reforms, we're going to get this corruption, this good old boy system out of the state of Alabama, which was a winning message. There's a reason that the Republicans took over the House and the Senate for the first time in the history of the state of Alabama when that happened, when that became their message, because people were tired of it. They were tired of the corruption, of the backrooms deals, of the rules for some people and not rules for other people, things that would take a normal citizen and put them in prison or face steep fines. Lawmakers were essentially just getting away with. And so this culture of corruption that was very prevalent right here in Montgomery, Alabama, with lawmakers that are in charge of making laws for our state, this was the answer to that. This was the state rising up and saying, no more, we're going to fix this. And that's a large reason why the Republicans were put into power. But this bill kind of aims at undoing all that. You guys know how incredibly upset I was over the gas tax. I'm a fiscal conservative. Republicans kept running as conservatives, saying that they would not raise taxes. And then somehow this thing just gets through incredibly fast, basically in the dark of night, in the 11th hour. They called a special session for it to make it easier to pass. And they went ahead and rushed the thing through before anybody had a chance to read it. I was furious about the tax and the bill itself, and I was furious about the way that it was passed. But I got to say, if this thing passes, this might actually be worse. And the reason that I say it's worse is, at least with the gas tax, as big a pain in the butt as that is, there is a return on it. I at least see how, even though I would disagree with the person, how they would be willing to part with some of their money, a large chunk of more of their money, to be able to get some of the infrastructure things done that we do legitimately need done around the state. I disagree with the methods. I disagree with their logic in saying that we needed this new revenue to do this. But at least I understand where they're coming from, even if I disagree with the conclusion they reached. This bill essentially takes all the teeth out of the ethics reform. And that is not a good thing. And we'll go ahead and get specific here. So what I'm going to do, I think that this is the, the best way to handle this that I'm going to essentially say, okay, this is what the law states now. This is current law. This is how this new bill would change it if it were passed. And so once we go through that, I think that's going to give you a, a better idea. It's going to give you a better idea of exactly how all of this is going to go and what changes it's going to make. And by the way, kudos to AL.com and Kyle Whitmire for doing some yeoman's work here. And I'm not saying that sarcastically at all doing some really good work, really good journalism down. I had to base a lot of the research that I did for this segment off of some of the work that he did in looking through this law and how it would change current law. So, you know, just kudos to them. Just give a hat tip to them real quick for that. And here's what we're going to do. Current law, then new law. So right now, the law states that lawmakers are forbidden from accepting any gifts over $25 from lobbyists, which makes sense. $25, you can understand if something under that, a lobbyist that just happens to be buddies with the lawmaker just kind of gives them, I don't know, a pin or something. Obviously, you don't, you want some kind of limit because you don't want somebody taken into prison for accepting a pin as a gift. Or again, just kind of like, you know, a lobbyist, a senator asks for a pen, he hands him his pen, he walks off with it, that we can throw that person in prison. The $25 law makes sense. It makes sense so you can't just litigate any little thing that happens. But $25 is a pretty good limit. What the new law does is it takes that limit off completely. And by that, I don't mean that it raises it to 100 or it even raises it to 1,000. There is literally no limit. Lobbyists can give gifts directly to lawmakers, no matter how expensive it is, and there are no limits on it. 
The one stipulation that the new law does do is that it says they any gift that they give, they have to report. Okay, so this is a problem for a number of reasons. First of all, so what? Are you basically telling me that a lobbyist could buy a new house or a yacht for a lawmaker, and as long as they write it on a report that they're fine? Are you kidding me? That would be like, if, and you guys know I'm a cancer survivor, that would be like somebody going through your body and finding, oh, you've got cancer, and say, okay, what are we going to do about it? It's like, well, I, I just told you that you have cancer. That is what we're going to do about it. No, you got to treat it. You have to do something about it. Essentially, what this new law would do is say, yeah, you can give a gift no matter how big it is, as long as you tell us that it's there. Well, telling you that it's there doesn't do any good. I mean, I guess technically it's better than not knowing that it's there. It's better than not knowing that your lawmakers are bought and paid for by lobbyists. But if you can't do anything to say no more, if you can't say no, you can't accept gifts from lobbyists, what's the difference? And that also brings me to another question. And this comes more from the enforcement side. There are steep penalties for someone that doesn't report a gift given to them by a lobbyist under the new law, but how are you going to catch them? How are you going to catch them? Are you just going to show up at lawmakers' houses and see if they've got any new stuff and ask them, hey, did you get this from a lobbyist or did you buy it yourself? I'm not saying that nobody will ever get caught, but the reason that this seems so incredibly flimsy to me is because essentially all you would have to do is not get caught. And unless there's going to be investigators showing up and doing an audit of your personal finances every once in a while, it seems that it's going to be very hard to enforce that rule. Now, maybe the odds of somebody getting caught taking something from a lobbyist were kind of slim under the, the current law, but at least then it had some teeth in it. And if you did get caught, then what would happen is so you, would have, you would face a really steep penalty. So let's go on. Another aspect of this under the current law, there are, if you bribe someone or there's a theft of government property, it is considered a Class B felony for a senator or a congressman. This new law would downgrade that to a misdemeanor. So instead of a Class B felony, which is right under a Class A felony, it's, it's the second highest classification we have, if you're talking about a Class B felony going from that to just a misdemeanor, basically a slap on the wrist, are you really telling me that a lobbyist can bribe a lawmaker into voting the way that he wants him to or doing some kind of government favor for him in exchange for something of monetary value and that's really just a misdemeanor? And let's also look at the thing theft of government property. It downgrades that to a misdemeanor, too. So if a senator or a House of Representatives representative winds up stealing something from the government, stealing a piece of property that was purchased by the taxpayers, that's all of a sudden just a misdemeanor? And here's another thing that's interesting about that, uh, about that particular shift in the law. If I steal government property, it's still a felony. If you steal government property it's still a felony. So what this law does by downgrading that to a misdemeanor is it essentially creates two completely separate classes of people. It's kind of like that old clip from Andy Griffith where Gomer is saying, hey, seems like to me that there's two kinds of rules. There's rules for regular people and rules for the police. Of course, when he and Barney are having a dispute over whether or not he broke traffic laws. But that's actually what would be happening here. There would be one set of rules for lawmakers that if they steal from government property, they just get a little slap on the wrist. It's just a misdemeanor to them. But if you steal government property, oh, we're throwing the book at you. It literally creates a two-class system of law enforcement when it comes to theft of government property. It's just mind-blowing that these people come up with this. All right, another aspect of this. Current law states that things of value, this is how it defines things of value, any gift, benefit, favor, service, gratuity, tickets, or passes to entertainment, social or sporting event, secure loan, 
other than those loans and forbearances made in the ordinary course of business, reward, promise of future employment, honoraria, or other item of monetary value. All right, so what's going to go on here is it's saying that this is what we consider things that you can't give to a lawmaker. And yet, the new law just says things of monetary value. You see the problem here? All those other things that we just talked about, there are some things in those categories that would consider, be considered of monetary value. So it wouldn't make all of those things null and void. But looking through this, there's an awful lot here that doesn't necessarily have monetary value that you could give somebody. So presumably lobbyists could say, look, our company is giving out this big award and there's going to be a big ceremony and uh, we would really like to honor you. And if you would vote this way, that would really help us. It would really help us out. And, and if you happen to pass this bill and, and if you became that vote, then, you know, maybe you could even win this award. Nudge, nudge. So you would be able to do that and it would be perfectly legal because it's technically not of monetary value. By the way, notice that the way that it defines it uh, here, things of value, it includes things like a job. But a job isn't necessarily something that could be considered of monetary value under this new law. And what that would mean is, let's say that there's a senator or a congressman that has decided that it's time for them to move on, they're lame duck, and so they're just writing out the end of their term and then in the 11th hour, since they're not running for re-election for whatever reason, a big company that would benefit from a law says, you know what, it would really help us out if you would vote this way. And if you do, well, you know, we might be able to find room for you at the company. That would be perfectly legal now. Be nothing illegal about that. I mean, you wouldn't be able to, as long as you couldn't prove that it was bribery, that there was an actual quid pro quo, as long as it was just sort of suggested that we could find a really nice, cushy job where you wouldn't really have to do all that much and there would be a six-figure salary involved, actually, that would not be considered illegal under the new law. Uh, another one, it redefines what a family is. So under the current law, it defines family as a spouse, dependent, adult child, a child spouse, a parent, a spouse's parent, siblings, and the spouses of siblings. So the reason that this is really important is because what the new law does is it defines family as just a spouse or a dependent. And I want you to notice the sleight of hand here, because where it's talking about a spouse, obviously the person that you're married to, or a dependent, what does that mean? Obviously, when you hear dependent, you think about child, but that's not what it says. It doesn't say child. It says dependent, which means that if your son is 20 years old and a company that's lobbying you says, you know what? I think that we could find a spot for him at the company and he would be making really good money. By the way, in a completely unrelated note, it would really help us out. In fact, we would be able to make a lot more money, be more profitable, and be able to hire more people like your son if you were able to vote this way and get this bill passed to help us out. You see how easy it is to abuse this? Because if you've got presumably all adult children, well, at that point, the only person that could get caught up in this legally would be if they promise something to you or your spouse. But if your brother-in-law or your sister-in-law needs a job or needs something else and the company promises them something, oh, they're not family. They're not family. That was completely unrelated. That was just a gift. It has nothing to do with me. You see how narrowing the definition of that really takes the teeth out of this law? You see how narrowing the definition of that really makes it easy for lawmakers to enrich themselves based on their office and their votes are essentially up for, for auction. I mean, if, if you just happen to help the right family member, like a parent or a sibling or an adult child, then you could presumably own a senator, 
own a, a, a member of the House of Representatives. It would be really easy for you to get your way in the House and the Senate if this takes place. Uh, another one, the current law, it uh, actually, any violations that take place there apply to either a lobbyist or a principal. Now, to understand what that means is the principal is the company that hires the lobbyist. And since we're, since it's me, I'm going to use an organization that I actually have some ties with and one that I really like. So you know that I'm just not singling somebody out because I don't like them. Let's look at the Farmers Federation. Farmers Federation does hire a few lobbyists and they have specific political agendas that they want to pass. And again, I don't think all lobbyists are evil. I'm not saying that, that all lobbyists would be willing to do this or anything like that. I'm just saying it opens the doors for lobbyists to do things that are incorrect, that would be immoral and to essentially own senators and house and house members. And it wouldn't even necessarily be limited to lobbyists. This could be just random people that have a political agenda that aren't necessarily lobbyists per se, but they want senators to vote a certain way on this. And so when it comes to this, you could have somebody presumably that is a, a company that is hiring these lobbyists and sending them forth to do this. And under the new law, you can't hold the lobbyists themselves accountable. The reason that's really significant is because, like I said, under current law, you can hold any violations of an ethics law. You can hold a lobbyist or a principal responsible for that, the person themselves or the company that they work for. The reason that it's so important that that is the case is because under the new law, you could only go after the principal. In other words, if a lobbyist violates some kind of rule, then all you have to do is go back to the company that hired them. But here's the thing. First of all, it gives some level of plausible deniability. And I'm not sure, and I'd have to talk to somebody that's a little bit more familiar with Alabama law than I am to make sure that my analysis of this is correct. But this is the question essentially that I have. Would that mean that presumably if some kind of violation took place, if the only thing that you can hold responsible for that violation is the principal themselves and I guess the lawmaker that was being lobbied, does that mean that from a legal perspective that they could only go after the lobbyists themselves, that they couldn't go after the lobbyists themselves, which means that all they would be able to do is find the principal. Because the principal can't go to jail. People tend to act a little bit more cautiously and make sure that they do not violate the law when they know that the, the threat of jail time is hovering above their head. They tend to act differently when that is the case. And so because of that and having that deterrent available, that makes somebody a little more cautious. When you can't hold the lobby themselves responsible, the lobbyists themselves responsible, it tends to make people act a little bit more recklessly and be, let's say, a little less cautious about whether or not what they're doing is technically illegal or not. And one of the reasons that I think that this could potentially be so problematic is what if the company claims, oh, that we didn't tell the lobbyists to do that. They went rogue. We didn't tell them to do that at all. They did that without our consent. Presumably, and, and again, maybe some of my legal friends that know a little bit more about Alabama law than, than me could chime in on this. But based on what I'm hearing and based on my understanding of it, what that means is all the principal would have to do, all that company would have to do is throw their hands up in the air and say, yeah, he went rogue. We, we don't have anything to do with it. We can't control everything that he does. He's our employee, but that doesn't mean we're responsible for everything that he does. And then they could get off scot-free because legally you can't hold the lobbyist responsible. So even if they did go rogue, even if the, what the company was saying was true, you wouldn't be able to prosecute the lobbyists themselves. There's just so many reasons that this is a terrible, terrible idea. Also under the current law, lobbying laws apply to the legislature, the governor, or a government agency. Under the new law, lobbying can only occur to the legislature. This is really odd that they didn't include the governor in this as well. But the reason that this is important is because 
it would not only exempt the governor, but it would also exempt government agencies. So in other words, if you were a company of, of some kind and you are regulated by a state agency, then you could go up to them and try to get your way politically. And technically that's not lobbying, which means any laws that apply to lobbying wouldn't apply to you. Any of that extra scrutiny, that extra regulation, even if you're going straight to the legislature's employees of the government that have a lot of say-so over your business, and you're trying to convince them to do this or that, that doesn't count as lobbying now. And so, again, that just opens up another door, another big gate for corruption to spill through. Uh, let's look at something else. The uh, current law states that the Alabama Ethics Commission can take and act on citizen ethics complaints or assist the district attorneys when asked to. Now, this makes sense because if a citizen sees something that they think may be unscrupulous, some kind of behavior that they think might be problematic by an official or a member of the government, they can currently report that directly to the Alabama Ethics Commission. That is something that they have as an option right now. That would not be the case if this new law passes. And so the, the only way that the Ethics Commission could, if they started an investigation themselves independent of a citizen complaint or if somebody comes to them and asks them to investigate, like a government official, then they could do it. But as far as a, a regular citizen, you would not be able to file a complaint, even if you saw something that was pretty damaging and, and pretty much proved that there was corruption going on, you wouldn't be able to report that to the Alabama Ethics Commission. And if you did, they wouldn't be allowed to act upon it. And another thing too, the district attorneys are essentially on their own now. The district attorneys would have the option to turn over a case that they found an ethics complaint over to Attorney General Marshall, I guess. But as far as the Ethics Commission itself, they wouldn't be able to assist in any way. And the reason that this is so incredibly sneaky, the reason that this is a horrible idea, is because the way that it would be easy to corrupt this system is those independent district attorneys, they don't have the resources that the Alabama Ethics Commission does. And so while the district attorneys have some power and some resources available to them, if you're talking about something that's really sophisticated or really complicated, for example, things that we would be talking about really, really big profile crimes like Mike Hubbard, former Speaker of the House, that would be left in the lap of the district attorneys if a citizen reported on it. The Ethics Commission wouldn't be able to do a thing about it. And if that takes place and the Ethics Commission is actually forbidden from helping them with that investigation, then a lot of these investigations, if they're really complicated or high profile, they might die on the vine just because the district attorney doesn't have the resources in his office available to him to be able to take it on. Now, again, one way that I guess this could happen is if the attorney general's office sees some merit in this claim and decides to take it over. But even that seems like it would be somewhat hindered by this new law the AG would have to take it over himself. And it, it's kind of vague about what, what exactly that process would look like right now. So there's so many reasons that this bill would really take the teeth out of the ethics commission. They would not be able to uh, act in the way that they are now. And like I said, even the attorney general's office would only be able to intervene if the district attorney's office picks up that case and, and essentially turns it over to them. So it just it adds a whole lot of obstacles to prosecuting people that are breaking Alabama law. And this should come as no surprise to anyone. I mean, it's it's horrifying to think that our own senators would be doing this. But unfortunately, that is the case as we see it right now. And speaking of the senators supporting it right now, that would be Senate Pro Tem Del Marsh, Jimmy Hawley of Enterprise. Tom Watley of Auburn, Clyde Chambliss of Prattville. Boy, that one burns me up. For those of you who don't know, Clyde Chambliss is actually my representative, and he already voted in favor of the gas tax, was one of the main people driving that. This pretty much puts the last nail in the coffin for me, and I was a Clyde Chambliss fan, but I have no intention of voting for him again after this. If he Especially if this winds up passing, the fact that he supported this just, oh, that burns me up. 
Tim Melson of Florence, Tom Butler of Huntsville, Will Barfoot of Pike Road. That's another one that kind of surprises me. Will Barfoot actually did the right thing and stood his ground on the, the gas tax. Uh, this is not looking good for Will Barfoot. I am really disappointed in him because of this. Uh, Chris Elliott of Fairhope, Shay Shelnut of Trustful, and Donnie Chastain of Geneva. So there's a, quite a bit here, quite a few senators that are supporting this thing. Based on these numbers, I would say it looks like this actually winds up passing in the Senate. And I want to ask you this question. Why would they do this? What could their motivation be? Well, there's two things I submit to you. I want you to make a comparison here. Look at Troy King, our former attorney general, and look at Mike Cubbard. Troy King was notoriously dirty and in the pocket of the gambling cartels. In fact, a lot of the ethics laws that passed in 2010 were passed specifically as a answer to things that Troy King did. Rotten to the core, but they couldn't really prosecute him on anything because technically nothing he was doing was actually illegal. And that's the reason these ethics reforms showed up. Because they realized that what he was doing was wrong, but not really illegal, and so they had to make it illegal. What this bill does is it essentially wipes out corruption by making almost anything that you can do legal again. That's the problem that we're running into. These ethics laws, not all of them, but are a big reason that Mike Hubbard is facing courts right now and is in the appeals process for the crimes that he committed and for misusing the trust of the people of the state of Alabama. But under these new ethics laws, a lot of the things that he did would be perfectly legal today. And so it seems to me that these senators that are supporting this bill, the only problem with the way that the ethics laws stand today is that they worked too well, is that they were actually getting rid of corruption. Because you contrast what happened to Troy King, which was basically nothing, and Mike Hubbard, which is broke a lot of the ethics laws on the books, you compare what happened to them, it's very abundantly clear that the presence of these ethics laws were acting, uh, were, were working correctly. They were working the way that they were supposed to and prosecuting people that were misusing the trust and the power of their office. And it seems to me that the senators didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that these laws are being enforced. And so what they're trying to do is gut the Ethics Commission, essentially to make it easier for them to be corrupt. And I think that says a lot about the people that are supporting it right now. I'm really bothered by the level of support that it has here in the Senate. And by the way, a good indication for how horrible this bill is, is both the Attorney General's office and the Alabama Ethics Commission are completely opposed to this. What does that tell you? Think about who is voting on this bill. Right now, it's the Senate. The senators, the people that this bill would ease requirements on, that it would make it easier for them to be corrupt, they're supporting it. The people that are in charge of prosecuting and investigating and going after ethics complaints, the Ethics Commission and the Attorney General's Office, they're diametrically opposed to it. That ought to be a pretty good indication to you that this bill is a really bad idea. I mean, you got to look at the bill on its merits, and we just did that. We just went through with a fine-tooth comb a lot of the things that this bill would change. But that by itself, the fact that the AG and the Ethics Commission are completely against it, and the senators who these laws apply to would get an easier ride in a lot of places, especially that even theft of government property, which would be a felony for a private citizen, is just a misdemeanor for them. That ought to be a pretty giant red flag that these senators are just trying to make it easier for them to engage in corrupt behavior. And I hate to say that, but that is the only, co the con the only logical conclusion I can come to. They want to bring back the good old boys club that Alabama was infamous for. And they might just do it. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. 
Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.